Hello, Breakthrough. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Justin Keller, and I am ready to tell you how to break up with your ABM program. Um, I presented this at live in Scottsdale, Arizona a couple weeks ago, and I asked the, the crowd to help me by show of hands um, how long they had been ABM practitioners. And the consensus was that pretty much everyone in the room had been doing it for at least a year, and about half the crew had been doing it for over four years. So pretty seasoned um, you know, group of, of ABMers in the room. I'm gonna assume that holds up for the people that are watching this live in Breakthrough Virtual. Um, but before we go any further, remember when ABM was this brand new thing that we were all so excited to be doing? Marketing finally had some foam focus. We had a brand new playbook we could all be running. We finally had a reason for our friends in sales to care about what marketing was doing. Um, it was a very exciting time and um, I was there for the whole thing. I've been doing ABM for, and I'll call it six years at this point. I even spent a little time working at an ABM company that I will not mention here, but I will say that now I am a ride or die Six Sense fanboy. Um, but it's one of those things where I've been doing ABM for so long that the magic kind of fizzled out for me, right? And I've been at Drift for about a year now. And when I came to Drift, the charge was, okay, keep the heat off of our marketing friends. Stay focused on the funnel. Make sure inbound is, is, is humming along. And between me getting so focused on that traditional funnel and me kind of having, you know, done several tours of duty with ABM, I found that fire inside me about ABM had all but fizzled out. And so I realized, you know, that's not just me. And if you're feeling that way about your ABM program, if it's not something you're fired up about and you're really passionate about, I promise you that your, your target accounts don't feel the same either. And it made me wonder kind of what made us fall in love with ABM in the first place. Um, and this is just like when, you know, maybe when you were younger, you were dating someone and you're dating them for a long time. And one day you just kind of look up and you ask yourself that awkward question, what are we doing here? And so, of course, in this case, we're talking about accounts. Um, but in either case, sometimes you have to have those really hard conversations with yourself about whether or not you should still be with this ABM program. Um, and to be clear, we are talking about ABM programs, even though there's going to be a lot of relationship parables in this presentation. Um, for the record, I have been happily married for a while. So it's been a long time since I've broken up with anyone, or if I'm being completely honest with the people that are joining me here live, since um, anyone has broken up with me, which was more often than not the case. So I wanted to come to this presentation with some, some hard data though, and I'm clearly not the expert anymore. So according to today's relationship experts on the internet, so you obviously know you can trust them, these are the three big red flags that you should be considering when ending your relationship. Again, to be clear with your ABM program, not here for romantic advice. The number one thing that you should be looking at is that you're holding on to the good memories. In 2018, 43% of companies said that ABM was critical. Those were the good old days I was talking about when we started here. And I can remember this so clearly in, in 2018, everything was ABM. And then a year later, that same survey, said that only 19% of people thought it was critical. Um, and so to make the relationship analogy, this is like when you're in a brand new relationship and you put everything into it, you, right? you won't stop talking to your friends about it, or in your case, you won't stop posting to LinkedIn about it. Um, you practice writing their name in cursive, you thought about what your kids look like, and then within a year that had all fizzled out. And maybe you realized it just wasn't the same ABM that you thought it was when you met, or maybe more likely, I think, that you figured out how much harder it was than you thought. So number two, you've stopped putting in the effort. Um, this is one of those things where, you know, like when you're in a relationship for a long time, it's, it's tough to constantly think of new things to do. What vacation can you take? Um, what, what new, you know, thing can you, you know, whatever their love language is, how can you read that and get them something that they want? This is something that you constantly need to be doing to make sure that people know they're loved and cared about, right? And this is true for your accounts. And I think the closer parallel here is personalization. 45% of companies say that personalization is their number one barrier to ABM success. And they are absolutely right. Personalization is so time consuming. It's super complicated. It can be expensive. Um, the data challenges are immense, but just like in relationships, you need to put in that effort. So whether it is taking the time that you need to collect like new use cases or pain points, if you're trying to break into a new vertical, um, 
it could take the form of stalking someone. And I'm, again, this is accounts, not relationships, stalking someone on social media, finding everything out you can about them so that when you make that first outreach, it really lands and is very personalized to them, makes them feel like they need to respond. Maybe you go so far as finding out who the CMO at one of your target accounts' favorite band is. And then going to eBay and ordering a rare import vinyl of their favorite record, sending it to yourself at your house, writing a handwritten note, asking if they would be willing to take a, a call with your team and then passing it along to them, which is actually something I've done before and it actually worked. The point I'm trying to make here is that nothing happens unless you really personalize it. And we've got all the data in the world that we need for this. Right. So there's no excuse to not be doing this unless you don't have the time. Maybe that's fair or that you just don't care, which I will posit is not a fair excuse, which brings us to number three. There's just not a serious commitment. Two years ago, only 17 percent of companies said that their ABM program was mature and driving results for them. Right. And for something that was as hot and transformative as ABM proved to be, so few people actually bit down. And, and have really committed to it. And I feel like that's where a lot of us are right now, right? COVID hit, our budgets got whacked, um, and marketers went into survival mode, right? We, we focused on keeping the sales lights on, uh, making sure the pipeline was still coming in. And if you think about this in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That, that big triangle with everything humans need to be happy and thriving, the very bottom layer is basically not starving and getting eaten by raccoons. Um, the stage above that is, is basic safety needs, right? So like, you know, am I, do I have a roof over my head? That's where we are right now. We are in the, do I have a roof over my head stage of our marketing? The one above that though, is love and belonging. And I'm putting forward in front of all of you that for your ABM program to be successful, you can't just have a roof over your head. You need to be focused on love and belonging. And it's tough to do with so many conflicting interests and competing priorities, but um, I will show you shortly why that is so important for you to do. So, um, <laughs> like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I realized when I per performed this live, um, performed, presented this live at uh, Breakthrough in Scottsdale that most of the room had no idea who Barry White is. It's skewed a little bit younger. So um, if you're on this call and you don't know who I'm talking about, go ahead and pop open Spotify and find out who Barry White is. Uh, he is a personal favorite and it's also very romantic stuff. So it's on brand, okay? Um, once we got at Drift, our, our inbound funnel pumping again, right, which is what I came in here to do, and it became time for me and my team to start driving more effective growth, like more efficient growth for Drift. Guess who was right there waiting for me? It was my old friend, ABM. Um, and so we were ready to fall back in love with ABM. And I'll tell you how we did that. And this is kind of the point of the whole presentation is, is how we fell back in love with ABM. That maybe looking back would have been a better um, name for this presentation. <laughs> All right. So before I go any further, let me introduce you to, I mean, kind of my ex, right? This is sort of still Drift's ABM program. And it had been running for several years before I got here. And to be completely honest, it's wildly sophisticated. One of the more sophisticated account-based environments I've operated in. In fact, the whole Drift team for a while now has existed only in terms of accounts, right? We only see accounts. We don't see leads. We seldom even say the word leads at Drift. So what we're looking at here in this outside circle is what we call our volume accounts, which is basically our entire ICP universe. We've got very, very tightly instrumented um, data that says this is what an ideal customer looks like for us. If you don't meet this threshold and you come inbound, um, we say thank you. We don't report on you, though. We don't write you to an SDR. You kind of get nurtured, but not really. Um, it, it's one of those things where we, we, uh, we've defined exactly what our universe looks like so well that we're able to filter a lot, a lot of the noise out. So the circle inside of that is what we call our target accounts. And these are accounts that have a high firmographic store, higher than normal, right? So this account segment is constantly scanned. It's constantly refreshed. And we definitely give preferential treatment to this sub universe of accounts, but in terms of doing actually anything personalized, we do very little, right? So if we're building a list of invites to a webinar, like the one that you're on right now, yep, these are the first ones on the list. If we're gonna do some syndicated content play, we only ask for accounts that are in this list. But in the way of personalization, we do almost, almost nothing. And then in the very middle, like the Copernican Center, of our account list is what we call the Drift 250. 
the absolute best fit accounts in the world. These should be our highest um, contract values ever. These are the companies with whom like the use cases are like written in just DNA. These were our white whales and we were generating basically no pipeline out of them, which was um, not really a head scratcher when we thought about it because we weren't really doing much with them, right? For these accounts that were so important, we were really not focusing on them like we should, giving them the love we needed. Basically, okay, here's the, here's the relationship analogy. We have the perfect person, boy, girl, whatever, in the middle of our universe waiting for us, yet we're out here playing the field. We've built this really sophisticated model to go out to every account in the world except for them. And um, whoops, that's kind of a mistake. And so here's what we did to fix that. We took a cue from our girl, Beyonce, and said, okay, if we really care about it, we need to put a ring on it. And this is the crux of this whole talk is when was the last time that you, your team, thought about creating beautiful, thoughtful, unique experiences for your most important accounts? Um, it had been a while. We hadn't done it since I've been adrift. Um, it was something where I started out my ABM career obsessed with doing, like getting really, really obsessed with targeted accounts and building out unique one-to-one -one, um, experiences for them. I knew it worked. And so it was time to get back there. We wanted to break up with that Drift 250 ABM model and fall back in love with that meaningful, heartfelt one-to-one -one program. And so here is what we did. We set three goals for the future of our new most important accounts. All right. First was we wanted to build personal relationships. And that starts with the meet queue, right? That first introduction is one that is so important that we wanted to make sure we absolutely nailed that because we wanted at the end of the day to create human to human connections. This was not you know, a brand to brand or a business to business thing. This was absolutely a human to human thing. Um, and we wanted to make sure we wanted to put that at the fore because we wanted to start conversations, which obviously is something that Drift cares a lot about. Quick side note, if you don't know Drift, we are a conversational marketing platform that's absolutely stellar. So that's why that is a little reference there. Um, second, we wanted to communicate better with our sales team, right? So ABM really only works if marketing and sales are pulling in the same direction. That had not been a thing for a while. So we created brand new engagement signals for our sales team. We created new dashboards that we could both look at together over Zoom meetings and that our SDR team could take action on when they saw certain intent triggers. Um, and this was something that we used to facilitate the conversations, which is absolutely important between the sales and marketing teams, but also to hold each other accountable, right? Pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but it's one of those things that if you're rebuilding your entire ABM program, that's an important thing for you to focus on. And lastly, we wanted to lock things down. So we were done playing the field. Um, we wanted these accounts to know that we really, really... Um, liked them, that we understood their pain points, that we we knew that Drift was a sympathetic, valuable solution to the problems that we were well aware they had. Ultimately, like these were the accounts that we wanted to bring home to our mothers. Um, I hope that these relationship analogies aren't getting too tired yet, but they're going to keep going. I apologize in advance if you're, if you're uh, squinting or furrowing an eyebrow at this point. So we took all those three things and here's what we spat out was what we called the ENT51 which looking back was a very dumb name, but it was a very good project. Um, and at this point in our story, our ABM program is now start like, you know, in the 90s rom-com um, teen movie, the nerdy girl is about to take off her glasses and reveal that she's been a smoke show this whole time um, as she's heading to prom. So bad name, you know, nerdy character, good project, about to go to prom. Um, and if you're wondering how we came up with that name, it was also pretty dumb. Like if I had a time machine, I'd probably come, you know, go back and think of something better, but it was pretty straightforward. We had 17 enterprise AEs. Um, we wanted to make sure we kept things very small and important. So we only let them have three accounts each. So three times 17 equals 51. Like I said, not clever at all, but the name stuck. And honestly, um, the name stuck because it was something new. It was fresh. And even though it was like a horrible brand name, it was a brand, right? We kind of rebranded our ABM program. And that ultimately helped us re-earn the trust in ABM across the marketing team, across the sales team, but like maybe even most importantly across the company, and especially at the C-level, right? This was a new, a new version of the ABM that had been, you know, kind of looked over for a while. And that put enough energy into it to get it to this critical velocity that it needed to take off. So those three accounts, though, I want to point out, and this is, I think, something important that I can impart to this whole audience. Um, we did not just say, hey, account executive, here's your three accounts. Let's go. Um, we did an intense amount of research and used a absurd amount of data to determine a really, really good 
account list, right? So like I, I mentioned, we've got a really strong data game, a really good account intelligence game. Um, so what we did was we basically started with Sixth Sense as kind of our central um, account intelligence, you know, hub. Uh, we use Alexa rankings here at Drift, which is kind of particular to us because in order for you to be a good fit for Drift, you have to have a substantial amount of um, inbound traffic and in order to facil facilitate those conversations. So we use that as a limiting factor as we, we build out our account scoring framework. Um, we use data providers, Apollo, Cognizant, increasingly less Zoom info, um, looking into um, Sixth Sense's data offerings. Um, and we're, we're doing this to make sure we're triple redundant, that we've got the most accurate data possible. So we've got this really HD, vivid picture of our account universe. So we compile all of that data and we come up with a very small set of very attractive accounts. So basically what we're doing is we're taking the first episode of a season of The Bachelor and saying, hey, AE, here's 15 accounts. You get to give a rose to three of them, which I've never seen The Bachelor is, I understand it is what means that they get picked, right? So this works really well because marketing has avowed this list. We know these are all good fits, but sales gets to exert their preference and say, okay, these are the ones I care most about. And that shows up in a big way, right? So we both have skin in the game, but sales has a little extra motivation to really want to win this account because, hey, they picked it, right? Um, and because I have been talking at things like this so much about ABM, I know that uh, a tech stack slide is basically obligatory. So like I said, like Sixth Sense um, was at the center of a lot of this. They helped us with our predictive and account intelligence, and they also helped us with our one-to-one -one display ads. And then we ran those same set of ads, and I'll show you an example of these in a minute, um, to our target accounts across social, right? So LinkedIn, especially we find works really well in this one-to-one -one context. You have to have a pretty big company in order for you to build that audience within LinkedIn. But if you're able to do it, obviously we're focused on the enterprise. So we were able to do it in many cases. Um, it works extremely well. We armed our SDR team with custom email templates, but we left a lot of white space in those um, because we let them know, hey, these are not a volume play, right? Take the time, learn about these accounts, learn about the people in these accounts especially, and make this super personal, right? So that came through as, as we handed these off to the SDRs and the AEs. We used a tool called Intellimize, which helped us to personalize the landing page. So we have 51 accounts that we're going after, we're sending all of those ads, ad clicks, um, all of those um, email templates, all of those sent go to one landing page, right? But there's 51 different experiences on that landing page, depending on which account is visiting it. So Intellimize did part of that, but then of course Drift did the other part of it, right? So every account that comes to that landing page is greeted by name. Um, we say hi to them in person, which I'll tell you about in a minute and create a very engaging experience. And then we leaned on our friends at RIDNA um, who helped us execute on a lot of the digital um, bits and bobs of this advertising piece to make sure we get it right. Okay, okay. A lot of preamble for what was actually a pretty straightforward campaign. Here's what we did. We built out these one-to-one -one ad campaigns, like I just said, greeting them by name, right? So putting the target account's name in the ad works every time. If there's one hard and fast rule I can tell you, it's that personalization drives engagement full stop. Okay, so that was very important. Um, and then we offered them a reason to pay attention to us, right? So if they click through on that display ad, they clicked through on the outbound email, we wanted to make sure that we hooked them right away. As I understand it these days, um, the people in the dating scene called it peacocking, right? So a reason for someone to take do a double take and make sure they're looking at us. The way we did this was we custom branded some nice podcast microphones um, and also some some AirPods. Uh, we, we put the Drift logo on. Um, Ultimately, because we wanted to be, we wanted them to have better conversations with everyone from their home office, right? The conversation theme is strong with Drift. Um, and then here's where it, I think was the magic of this whole program is we made it a point to introduce a human, right? This wasn't a, hey, come learn about Drift thing. This was a, hey, meet Sarah. Our AEs recorded custom Drift videos for every single account personally introducing themselves, right? So when that account came to the landing page, the, the Drift chat experience automatically popped up, said, hey, you know, target account, insert target account here. And then the video from the AE introducing themselves personally, saying that how excited they are to chat with them. This drove engagement through the roof, huge smash. 
So it was a lot of work to pull all this together, honestly. Like, I mean, the the amount of cat herding to get um, AEs to record three personalized videos was a, a bit of a pain. Um, we got it. Thank you if you're listening to the Strict AEs. I appreciate you. Um, and the whole thing was not expensive, though, right? That whole that whole thing I just showed you, all the targeted ads, the, the nice swag AirPods was about $8,000. And to be completely honest with you, we still have a lot of those mics and AirPods waiting for a new home. So we haven't even, like sent their spent sent and spent all of that budget the biggest expense honestly was the people hours for making sure everything was personalized um because that was what was important right putting the effort into making sure that they know we care was where we spent the most of our resources because as i said personalization drives engagement and when somebody um engages with you that hard when you put that amount of work into it they do not leave you on red they engage and here's what happened with these 51 accounts in just under three weeks, right? 21 days, actually probably like business days wise, probably 15 days. The display ads had a 5X click through rate of all of our normal ads, right? So they were getting clicked on quite hard. Um, that landing page, that single landing page, almost a quarter of the people that visited that landing page engaged with Drift. And when at Drift, when we say engagement, it's not that, hey, this person visited a landing page. It's no, this person interacted with the Drift experience. So about a quarter of them interacted with the chat. And of those who interacted, half of them converted, gave us their contact info, said, yes, I want to learn more. And within three weeks, we created four opportunities, one of which came inbound. And if you have been doing ABM, you know how rare that is to have an account actually just come inbound. You usually have to do a lot of air cover and then go out and get them yourself. Nope, they were coming to us this time. But I think most importantly, impressively, is that we built over a quarter of a million of dollars in pipeline in under three weeks. It's a 33x ROI on the whole program. But like I said, we haven't even sent, spent all of that program. So on a per account basis, that was more like a 1700x ROI. Now, this was at the beginning of Q2. So it's been for almost, no, actually, it's been five and a half months for us now. Um, what's happened since then? Well, in under three months, that one campaign aimed at 51 accounts has influenced $1.1 million in pipeline, which was so much that more than we had ever expected. But it just goes to show you why everyone was so gaga about ABM back in the day, right? When, when you put that amount of effort into it, it comes back to you tenfold or like, I don't know, a lot more fold. I don't have the math on me, but it's a lot more fold. Um, so we had gotten so obsessed with the basic blocking and tackling of marketing, we forgot about the potential upside of just caring a little more could have about our target accounts. And to prove that I'm not completely full of shit, here is the six cents screen from that shot. So if you look closely, you'll see 42 of those accounts are in the purchase stage right now. And if you look closelier, you will tell that I am a little bit full of shit because if you do, if you add up the bottom rows there or columns there, um, it actually adds up to more like 53 accounts we had a couple of accounts get added later in the thing, and I just didn't want to change the name. I couldn't, I couldn't be troubled with that. So the ENT51 is the ENT53. Take that to your grave with you, please. So what's next for us? Um, well, uh, gosh, uh, three weeks ago now, four weeks ago now, we launched the ENT102. See what we did there? We took 51 and we doubled it. Um, and so that launched, gosh, okay, so it is currently what day? Okay, so let's say that launched three and a half weeks ago. Between then and now, I kid you not, we have booked 10 meetings off of the ENT 102, right? So within three and a half weeks, so about the same timeline as the ENT 51, we've had a 10% conversion rate, three of which, right? I, I said one of them came in inbound. We've had three of them come inbound this time. Um, We've also started this brand new thing called the ABM Council, which includes members of our demand gen team, our field ops team, our sales leaders. Um, I think that's it. Oh, marketing ops is absolutely there. In fact, marketing ops runs the whole thing because they're kind of a neutral third party, right? They can show us the data, they can benchmark everything, and they can be, you know, the honest um, intermediaries that let us know, okay, here's actually what's happening. Here's how everyone should engage. Um, and in, it, they're showing us what works, what doesn't, so we can figure out how to improve this and optimize it and hopefully scale it out bigger. Um, and one of the things we are doing is rolling out more one to few programs. This time we're focused a little more, more vertically. And I know what you might be thinking, Justin, isn't this one to few experience what got you in trouble in the first place where you stopped focusing on building pipeline with your most important accounts? You are absolutely right. But 
this time around, because we've got so much buy-in from the sales team, because it's a new brand, because there's so much more energy around it, I actually think it's going to be something that sales still cares about. What a time to be alive. Um, and then we are um, doing an, another thing, two more things, a programmatic velocity play, right? So based on your opportunity stage in our CRM, we are showing you different offers, right? So if you're at this stage, you know, early stage in the funnel, we're saying, hey, learn about all these cool use cases. If you're way down the opportunity stage, it's, hey, look at all of these um, these these you know case studies and testimonials, right? And they automatically get served based on your stage in the field, hopefully to compress the sales cycle, help our sales team close more deals faster. So the call to action for everyone in this webinar, whether it is in life or in business, I'm here to tell you that it's absolutely worth going out of your way to show people that you care. I think that giving a shit is going to be one of the biggest competitive advantages that you can have, especially as we're coming into a new year, tightening budgets, like, you know, we may or may not be going into a recession, who knows, but that's it. It's pretty simple stuff. And that's also pretty much the only way that ABM works, right? It's not budget, it's devotion, right? Like I said, we spent like less than $8,000 to generate um, 200 and like a quarter of a million dollars in pipeline even more since then. Um, and it's just because we showed accounts that we cared. And if you can do that right, you can start to build predictable revenue around it. And if you can do that right, you can be become re less reliant on, on those exhausting inbound plays that are so unpredictable and require so much energy. And you can start to fall in love with your ABM program again. And so in order of importance, here are the things I think. One, showing you're devoted. Two, it's using data intelligently. And three, it's having some amount of technology, but honestly, if you've got the first one and a little bit of two, you don't even really need the third thing. I have run many ABM programs that had little to no technology underpinning them and they still worked really well. So I'm almost out of time here. I appreciate you so much for joining me. Honestly, this whole presentation could have been three slides. Like we had a tired ABM program. We started all over and we kept it small and things went well, end of presentation. But I think that, um, that kicking the dead horse about showing that you care about your target accounts um, and then maybe introducing a few people to Barry White was worth the time. I hope you think so. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, here's my contact info. Six Sense Breakthrough, you guys are awesome. Uh, Justin Keller from Drift, thank you all very much.